Welcome to the Austin Action Fest Podcast. We focus on filmmaking from idea to distribution and everything in between. We focus on you getting your project in the can and for the world to see. Thank you for listening to the Austin Action Fest Podcast. Film set. Awesome. Well, chill if you don't like kicking us off with a little intro. Uh, at least the verbal version. That'll be good. To, that'll be cool. Well, let's see here. <laughs> I actually wrote, I was smart enough to write it down. Okay. Because because it did come off the top of my head. That doesn't mean I smart to remember it. Okay. Welcome to the Austin Action Fest podcast, where we talk about you getting your film in the can, sending out to the world to see. That's right. Welcome to the Austin Action Fest podcast. Let's get cracking. <laughs> oh, no. I think that last part was, it was amazing. And we're doing this every time. <laughs> no more logos. It's just chill doing that. Awesome. Um, all righty, guys. Thank you so much for being here again on another podcast of the Austin Action Fest. Um, I am one of your humble hosts, Benjamin Nathaniel Reddick II, a.k.a. The Violence Conductor. Chill. Introduce yourself, sir. My name is Chalimber Washington. I am also co-founder of the Austin Action Fest, filmmaker in training and badassery. Danielle. Hi, I am Danielle Weatherford. I am a director, producer, actress, as well as a entrepreneur for so many different things. So welcome uh, to the podcast. Keisha. Hey. This is Keisha, and I am the coordinator for Austin Action Fest. Um, I direct, I write, I act, I also sing. Yay! Happy to be here. <laughs> and let's, we're going to introduce our guest. Yes. And we have, I, go ahead. <laughs> I'm Larissa Julianis, and this is my husband, CJ Julianis. Hey, everybody. We're a co producing team. He's also a director, I'm an editor, a writer, and an actress. Yes, and today we have the pleasure of discussing their new film, Mistress, 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 Man Eater. It's going to be a fantastic one that's coming out tomorrow, I believe, right? October yes, 3rd? Yes, on Amazon yeah. Prime, yeah, Prime Video. And they, and they were gracious enough to give us enough time, last minute, honestly, on our part. We saw the film, and we said, hey, we got to have you guys on before the movie goes live, and they, they made time for us, and they've been very, very patient with us. And they're here to share all their pearls of wisdom and all their years of knowledge that they would like to uh, impart on the rest of the filmmaking world. So we're very thankful to have you guys here. Uh, so let's get right into it. As I said, people have been waiting for like 22 minutes because we had problems with OBS. So <laughs> tell us a bit about your journey of uh, you know becoming filmmakers and, and the reason why or how you got into this whole wild world of film. I have been in the film industry since I graduated from Columbia College, Chicago with an interdisciplinary film uh, theater degree back in 2003. And I've been with the, the, mostly the talent circle here in Chicago with the various agents for commercial on-camera work, uh, modeling work. I so said, uh, it takes a while to crack, didn't get into it. So I've been SAG-AFTRA for about 10 years now. And my husband and I met doing theater. So that's where we got a lot of our storytelling chops from to actually be able to run a production and wear all the hats we need to be able to wear. Exactly true. So I'm CJ and I've been in the entertainment business since I was a kid. I got out of it for a while. I was actually discovered when I was in the military, a talent agent found me. I was kind of like Rita Hayworth. I wasn't pulling uh, sodas at, at the counter though. And um, I was the artistic director of a theater company here in Chicago. That's where I met Larissa. Um, I cut my teeth directing and producing for the stage. And uh, that led logically to us doing film together. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So we, <laughs> we've talked about a number of different things while we've been waiting here. Tell us, what is it like doing film in your, your neck of the woods? Because you guys aren't based in California. So what, what's that like for you guys? There's definitely some pros and cons. Uh, the pros are that things are a lot less expensive. 
So you don't have to be paying for, you know, through the nose for a soundstage that every extra minute is going to cost you tons of money. And then you have to pay for parking for all your cast and crew on top of it. We don't necessarily have a lot of sound stages out here, um, but, you know, beyond Cinespace, which the Dick Wolf shows use. So for a production on our level, we found a lot of our own locations and a lot of those were very affordable. And we also in the local community here, because we live live outside the city in a smaller town. And there was a lot of enthusiasm uh, because a film has never been shot or hasn't been shot in this area in a very long time. Versus if you're filming in California and it's sure you can shoot a film here, it's gonna cost you this many tens of thousands of dollars to get a permit. Wow. <laughs> here it was more like, you're, you're doing what? Yeah. You're, you're a movie, like, like a real movie that, uh, sure, I guess you could shoot here with, so, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that yeah. was more of the response we got, <laughs> pretty much. Yes. So that is the beauty of it, the nuance that people have, because they're like, oh, a movie? They get excited about it. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> so, so go, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Joe. I'm sorry. I no, I, I was wondering, um, what, what got past you the point of wishing? And, and grinding and just being part of, of a slice. What got you to where, like, hey, I've been talking about this for years, or we've been talking about this this project for years. What got you to the point to where you started talking, not only past talking, buying stuff? What 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 got you past? What got you putting money into it? Well, that is a long journey indeed. Um, obviously, since I majored in screenwriting and I've been a, a produced and published playwright for many, many years now. So I had gotten my feet wet as a professional in theater because mm -hmm. you can stage things for a lot cheaper than you can film them. Mm -hmm. And so that was the way I was able to get that itch scratched as a storyteller and as a writer. I couldn't fund a 200 a million dollar ancient world epic but i could stage it for a heck of a lot less and use multimedia and then film it pbs special style so on and so forth so that was sort of my baby steps to getting where we are today uh, i began working with some local independent filmmakers who were making it happen on a low budget and still managing to turn out quality pieces. Uh, two Nine Productions, we became affiliated with uh, some years ago. And I started thinking, you know what, maybe I need to revisit this idea of screenwriting, but on a less expensive level, which is the challenge for me personally, because I like big fancy set pieces and lots, <laughs> lots of extras and action sequences and all the things that all of us love. That isn't, yep, 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 there we go. And that's not necessarily just two people sitting in a cafeteria having a conversation right <laughs> exactly true and i'd like to kind of piggyback on what larissa said um the the idea that larissa and i we met in theater we've done theater for a long time i'm very experienced with directing and producing theater i also directed and produced a lot of corporate and industrial video but do, doing theater and doing it at high level for a long time you reach a point where you got to take the next step. Mm -hmm. And I'm also been married to Larissa for 15 years. We've been together for 16 years. And I've been watching Larissa kind of scratch at the glass ceiling in the Chicago entertainment business for a long time. And she's had numerous opportunities in the past to lead a movie where the funding fell through and she didn't get that opportunity. And, you know, as a husband, when you're with somebody for a long time, you see that kind of like disappointment. You see that kind of thing going on. And uh, when you when you're with somebody as long as I've been with Larissa, and you realize the talent she has, you really want to see your partner succeed. And actually, it was a huge disappointment that I received professionally with a television show I've been developing that got a, a very big no at a high level after a, you know many years of mm. the process. Um, fortunately, it's still alive and it's had new life, but I thought that was the death knell. And that was very mm -hmm. difficult for me to see three and a half years of work seem like it was all for nothing. And I right. saw that. 
And yeah. that was when Craig said, we're going to do your movie. And I said, we're, we're, what, we're, we're, what, 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 what do you mean? I don't want egg on my face. <laughs> we all know those filmmakers that thought, oh, I'm just going to make a movie and it's going to be the greatest movie ever. And I don't need help from anybody. And I, you know, and which and, is of course nonsense and have delusions of grandeur and then end up losing their shirts and you never hear from them again. And I was like, I don't want to be that person. Mm. But what I realized um, as time went on, and as we really truly committed to this, we were finally able to do it, not just because <clears throat> we had um, generated our own funding, but because we had the network we needed. Mm-hmm. So we had the DP and co-producer in our network that we knew we could trust and we could work with. We had the line producer that could show us how to turn, you know, make a dollar out of 15 cents, as it were, that would say, okay, you need to work with this person. You met them on that set. This person will be great and would love to work on this with you. You met them on this set. Right. Um, and then some of the various uh, performers we had in the cast all except for two of the, the main characters were all personal friends of ours. So we had Bonnie nice. Morgan and Molly Morgan, who are very well known in their own rights out in LA uh, for all the movies they've done. And Cinda Williams, who's a personal friend of mine. Hmm. And they were all people who believed in the project, close friends with us and were willing to come out and do it. So I realized too that it's not just a matter of funding for taking the leap. It's, are you connected? Do you have the network you need? Because it truly does take a village. Yeah, mm-hmm. and there's one other thing Larissa missed. She and I wore about 10 hats each throughout the mm-hmm. entire official process. We handled, our, we handled our movie making and establishing our film company, Binary Star Pictures, as a, as a startup. And when you start a business, you know, you're, doing, you're, you're the CEO and you're the toilet cleaner. And you do everything in between. And that's kind of how we looked at it. We, 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 the, our talents are really rich and varied. And we were able to do a lot of the things ourselves that we typically would have had to pay other people to do. And all of the money that we saved, we plowed right back into the movie. So, right. yeah. All right. So, so I'm glad you're able to go through this process, but, and all, not glad to go through because it's hard as hell. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about, but yeah. Um, so we get to the point to where, what the, okay, that was weird. Um, so, you, so you get to a certain point that you're, you're, you're yes, you know you're going to make this film. You have, I guess, uh, the structure, you have, you have the framework there. Mm-hmm. How do you start, start, just for the people that don't know, how do you fill feel, feel that out? You, you got, you got the uh, skeleton, the, the muscle, the skin, as far as how to build it. Uh, what do you do from there? You truly have to start with a solid script. Yeah, that's the first thing. Your foundation of everything is that any production company, we, we've all seen it. I mean, we we all saw the remake of Star Wars. There was no story there. Mm. Yeah, right? We're all hiding our faces like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we all yeah. thought it. And, they, oh. and the producers thought that they could make a movie and rely on CGI, but they didn't spend the money developing a story and developing exactly. an art. Yeah. And a good story. Now, all of us as producers, now I, I, I heard everybody on here, we're all producers, mm-hmm. we're all involved in things. When we're looking at spending a year, a year and a half, two years of our lives doing this, if you don't have a solid script, with a lot of heart and a lot of human aspect to go with all of the other stuff that you're doing, the kind of things that make people want to pay attention and watch, you don't have a project. Exactly. You literally, so every single one of us as independent filmmakers, I've said this time and time again to other independent filmmakers, we are all the arbiters of taste. If we can read a script and we can see it in our heads that it can be done and can be done at a high level, then it's worth considering. But if the writing isn't there, or if you if you put if you read that script and you and you if there's anything in you that goes, eh, it you shouldn't do it. It's fascinating how that's the one aspect of indie filmmaking that costs the least amount of money, mm-hmm. but can cost you the most money in the long in run. In the long run, because you don't have a movie. There. If it's so, not there. what's your what's your feedback loop? And what I mean by feedback loop who do you look to to help you to go to assess because you might think your script is all that 
who are your go-tos for your for your feedback when it comes to what I can answer no, that. I can tell you that okay, it was a long ahead. process. It's it a is. very long process for me. So I generated the first draft of this script in the spring of 2014. And it was just supposed to be this lark, this romantic comedy, nothing too serious, inexpensive. Like I said, challenge for me. So I just wanted to conquer that little inexpensive mountain as the best of my abilities. And I sent it for coverage, which I highly recommend. Um, uh, Suzette and Shannon Brown of 2-9 Productions, who were line producer and second male lead and kind of helped um, mentor us in a lot of aspects of pre-production, um, they suggested this is they do that for all their scripts. And I highly recommend that to all the screenwriters out there to send your script for coverage. So that's when a pot, you know, for 150 bucks, you can have a couple readers from a studio actually you know, summarize your script, say, this is what works, this is what doesn't work, this is what I suggest. And I had two very different sets of coverage and they were painful to look at at first. Like every writer will tell you. That's your that, baby. That's yes, your it's baby. my baby. You had to be told past, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, right? But I let it sit. I worked on other projects. I was developing a, a, a TV show. And then I came back to it because um, director Julian Grant, I was in a feature that he directed for with 2-9 Productions. Um, he said, you know what? This should be a, a, a novel series you can do cross-platform marketing. Mm. And since I enjoyed a lot of um, uh, uh, subcategories of the romance genre, and this would be like romantic comedy, I said, you mm -hmm. know what, I think I could do that. And I would have total freedom. I wouldn't be thinking about all of the restrictions for filmmaking. All I had to think about was how to make the best story, the best characters possible. It really makes you dive deep when you are writing prose because you get inside mm. the character's head. Right all of their perceptions, everything they see. It's not just, oh, just write a few lines down on, on paper and be done. You I mean, you have to spend a lot of time and emotion with this. So I truly believe that was where the meat of the, my script came from. It was no longer two inches deep. It became 20 fathoms deep. Right. And so, so I actually would uh, pitch that at uh, novel writing conferences. And I got feedback from those agents I was pitching to. They were scared of it. They said, you know, this sounds like a, a great idea, but I can pitch dominatrix. I can pitch mm -hmm. priest. I can't pitch them to the same person. <laughs> yeah, that's, they're not supposed to come together. No. Yeah. I was very curious as to how that was going to shake out when the yeah. premise kicked up. I was like, oh, we're doing, we're doing those two. <laughs> <laughs> well, even, even the, uh, the, the folks who wrote the coverage, they said, they said Hollywood won't touch us with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> it's dangerous. They said, make him like a children's entertainer on TV or something. I was like, nah, that's boring. Let's raise the stakes. Let's make it truly dangerous to where, well, he's an Episcopal priest, so he can date and marry. Mm -hmm. But let's make, make it so dangerous to where if she doesn't seduce and extort him, she's going to lose her life in 90 days. But if he falls for her, he's going to lose his cover. He's going to lose his career. He's going to lose his, his life that he has so carefully built. But that is true screenwriting is raising the stakes. Yeah. So I took all of those principles of not only that from screenwriting and that structure, but from novel writing. Uh, right. One of the, one of the, the structural um, rules of romance novel writing in particular, because it is so structured, there are very particular rules. And one of those is you need an internal arc and an external arc. So you have the internal journey that she has to go through of finding her self-worth again, which is partly there because she finds her soulmate, someone who inspires her to complete herself. Mm -hmm. But then you also have the external journey of defeating the, um, the toxic masculinity that she faces in her life and the threat to her own, her, her physical safety and her life. And the same with his character. So there's a lot going on. There's four different arcs that have to be fully fleshed out and explored. And I felt I could only do that in a novel manuscript. And then over a couple of years, I brought that back into the screenwriting form, had a lot of feedback from some wonderful people, mostly CJ here, who would read every draft and he knew my heart and he could see it and he un understands my writing like no one else. And he that could is, say, wait, how this many works. Pages, how many pages were these drafts? 
Oh, well, the first... There were a lot at first. Let's see. I think <laughs> I think lot. the first adaptation I did of it was in one th- one thirty something. And the shooting script was down to one seventeen, but that ended up with a rough cut that was 215, which I do not recommend for the indie world. And we got a lot of pushback, even when I cut it down to 202 and we felt it was tight. It still wasn't tight enough. So that took months of us going back and forth, trying to take out every ounce of fat we possibly could. Extra lines that didn't need to be there. Extra shots that didn't even, you know, scenes and sequences. Yeah, we already felt that it was lean and we made it even leaner, even tighter so it would just move. Because so often that's the issue with independent films. They don't move. It's like, oh, I get this. Uh, well, I right. literally yeah. just had to, had to send something to uh, an online distributor and I was like looking through my old projects and I found an old one. I was like, oh my God, there's so much I would have cut out of this. This is mm-hmm. so ridiculous. So yeah, there's always more fat to trim. Uh, that's, and that's, that's what you're talking about is the process everyone should go through. So I'm curious, are there any specific books that you read in school, out of school, that uh, as far as the screenwriting part was concerned, really helped you dial it in like this is the one like if you had to pick one book that everyone should read do you have any suggestions on that or you know i've read a few i believe the one i used as a guide early on with this because i was coming back to screenwriting after so many years of doing theater and other things i believe that was the screenwriter's bible let's see do i have it on one of my shelves well, it's the screen artist, but screen we're not going to go grab it. Yeah, it was, it was something yeah. that was a must read in my... Yeah, there we go. There you got it. it. You got it. <laughs> that, was, that was a required reading when I was in school studying screenwriting. And the biggest help for me was um, j- just the, the plot points. Act one. This is everything you need to cover. Um, and I, I've actually, the last couple scripts I've read, I've actually based them around a young lady online talked about having 27 beats, having three acts within each of your three acts and breaking them down from there. Huh. So often I have so many great ideas for scenes, like, oh, this would be great if we have this and this and this, you know, all these different ideas, but it's like, how do I order them now? How do I build these into sequences? And that gives me, and I gave me a great idea, um, great ideas for the flow, the ebb and the flow, the, the highs and lows that you have to hit throughout every single point and your midpoint, what that has to look like, your turning points, your, uh, your darkest moment at the end of act two. Right. What was the dark night of the soul? Yes. Yes. Um, what I found, especially, you know, within my own stuff, and I'm old enough where I can say this now. Anyway, um, <laughs> is you have to know, know the rules so well that you can break them and break them well. It's the same uh, in acting. They mm-hmm. say, you know, learn all your lines and then throw them away. Mm-hmm. And it's like, what, what does that mean? You don't know what that means until you actually do it. It's exactly yeah. true. And I, so I'm going to add to what Larissa said. Uh, we, And this is also foundational for actors and for directors and producers. And this is for everybody who's listening or who's going to listen. Doing theater is the foundation of your skills whether you're acting or directing or producing. When you do theater on an ongoing basis, you look at these scripts and these scripts obviously are their massage and they're published already, but you can look at a script and as an actor, you're gonna learn how to break down a script for beats. You're gonna learn how to break down a script for emotions. You're gonna learn how to break down a script for any number of things. The other thing that you always need to look at when you're looking at beats is like, where are the dramatic moments and where do you lighten it up? How do you interpret a script? Um, There's a a zillion different ways to do drama. There's only one way to do comedy. There's There's only one grade for comedy. Is it funny? That's it. If it's not funny, you failed. And when you, when you do theater and you learn those lines and you embody characters that allows you as an actor to kind of like almost naturally in your bones, know what you need to do with a script even when you go on to an audition, if you go to an audition, they're going to hand you 
you might have sides that you already learned that they might hand you a script and say, oh, you know, read this for me. And you've never seen it before. Mm -hmm. So instinctively, you need to know how to break it down. You need to know where your beats are going to be, where you're going to put accentuation on lines, all of these different things. They all seem very minor, but they add up to a huge, huge hole. And I would recommend anybody who's doing film to spend some time doing live theater. It's a lot less expensive too. It is. Very <laughs> <laughs> true. Those you're talking about, I, I can attest to being in casting calls and it was, I learned that stuff the hard way. Cause I didn't get to, I didn't go to school to do a lot. I kind of dragged into film like from other, other uh, areas. And so I didn't plan on being in front of the camera. So I got dragged in front of the camera. So I was like, well, I'll get an agent and see how this all goes. So I remember going to a couple of auditions. They were terrible. I was terrible. I knew I was terrible. And one of those was a cold read. And it was like, hey, you got five minutes. Give us something. And then like, I had gotten a little bit better by that point in time, but I was in a scene with a partner. And my partner was terrible. And I was like, oh. Or even better. It's the worst. I was like, oh, I don't know how to save this. This is not good. I don't know how to, what to give you to make this better. But then it was like, oh, I've been this guy. Like, I've probably done this to somebody else's audition. <laughs> terrible. So a lot of, I mean, you learn a lot of things through pain, but it's much better. All you people at home, you actors and everyone else. Learn from what these two are telling you right now, because it is much, it is much less embarrassing than having to look back and see that. Oh yeah, I probably should have taken those stage classes, or a lot of people <laughs> suggest uh, improv. Improv yeah, is improv huge. Improv well. Yeah, we've done a lot of. Larissa and I do, have done a lot of improv in the past, but yeah, when you're doing auditions for film or any, I was on set. I was doing a, a webisode series, and I was on set with a bunch of actors. And they found out that I was a director and producer. And of course, they came to me for all kinds of different things. But I talked to a lot of actors who would say things to me that were kind of like astounding to me. Like, oh, you know, I, I, I don't want to do theater. I want to do film. Film, you know, the theater takes too long. The process is too long. I can't I memorize all those lines. I can't memorize all those lines. I just want to come on film set and, 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 and be a film actor. And then I would see what they did on in the scenes. And I'd be like, it was just, you know, it was just <laughs> mediocre. It, it was not compelling. You know, there was nothing to hang any kind of meat on in the scene. And it frankly, was, I was embarrassed for some of the actors. Well, I think that know? goes back to, so, do you want to be a movie star or do you want to be a great storyteller? Oh, talk about oh, this, please. That is, yes. Because there are that's, different things. Because when you, to be a great storyteller, that's where, uh, what I saw in the theater where people came together, they weren't getting paid. A lot of times it cost them money to be part, but they were passionate about this story and they were passionate about telling it together as a team. Those are the people you want to work with on a film set when you're like, hey, so-and-so, um, can, can you just hold this light over here really fast so we can get this shot? And you're, you're the one who wants to be a movie star is probably like, not going to be too yeah, happy yeah, about no, it. Yeah, I don't do it. <laughs> but the one who's used to helping out and because knowing it takes a whole team to tell a quality story and they're passionate about your story, they're going to be there for you on those mm. late nights and helping you out and not adding to your stress. Yeah. Uh, but even, even more so to that, to that I think uh, Ben and I, you, um, we were talking about it, how it's more important to us to be part of a quality story than how big our role is. Because you see, yes. and that, well, that will reflect on you with branding as well. I've seen a lot of performers that, yes, they might get leads in these short movies or whatever they're part of, but you just, all you have to do is glance at the movies and autumn, and your respect for that person as a serious actor is diminished. Mm -hmm. Versus if they have a small role in something with quality filmmaking, quality yeah. storytelling, people who take it seriously. Yeah. And then you think you think better of that person's abilities, even if they didn't get 30 <laughs> scenes. They clearly yeah. attach themselves to a project with a worthwhile story, yeah. with worth, worthwhile um, quality. Yeah. yeah. What What are examples do you see of that? What actors or actresses? Oh, wow. See that? I mean, there's plenty of them, but I, for people that are not in it, who, who would you name? 
Um, I don't, I, I don't think there's anybody famous know. that yeah. I would mention. Um, you know, there's not. Well, let me tell you my perspective as a, as a director, a longtime director. Um, I'm also an actor, you know, so I'm a, I'm a lot like all of you. I, I don't audition anymore, but people know who I am and what I can do. And they'll call me in to do whatever because of who I am. And oftentimes when I'm on a, on a set and I see the way an actor or performer kind of like per, comports themselves in their role, I'll know almost immediately the people that I'm going to look to in the future of who I want to work with. So that's another thing for actors. Everything you're doing today you're laying the groundwork for the work you're going to do next year or two years from now. And you want to go on a set and you don't want to be amateur. You don't want to look like you don't know what you're doing. You don't want to look lazy or egotistical or like a diva or a devo. You want to be a team player with everything. That you do. It's true. It's true. De devo. I'm writing that down. Devo. <laughs> Whip it good in the shape. It's yeah. not too late. Well, you, you asked for an example. I say that we had um, even a minor one in casting. We, uh, I was contact when I put out the the casting call because we were own casting directors as well. You know, indie startup. It's rough. When I put out, yeah, when I put out the <laughs> casting call for our male lead to um, agents in LA, I received a phone call from an agent out there who represented a, um, I'd call maybe a, a C-list action star. And we, we researched everybody, even the local folks who no one's ever heard of. I looked up everything I could find on them, all of their work, wherever it was, I'd pay for it on Amazon. I want, before I wasted their time, I wanted to know what they could do. Thank you. And so this, this particular action star had many titles out there. He was the lead in many, but they were not quality. And <laughs> And so we ended up casting Mickey O'Sullivan, who I'm sure everyone will hear of, even though they haven't already. He, Good. none of his uh, features had come out yet. We were his second and his first one hadn't come out yet. But I had seen just enough in his, um, his reel from guest, uh, guest starring uh, or on PD, Chicago PD and various other shows and small things he had done in addition to what he brought to us in the um, audition, which was complete commitment, his theater resume, as long as my arm, and we knew this person is going to take this seriously and is going to reflect well on our film and make my writing look good. That's exactly <laughs> true. So when it comes to theater, I think actors need to realize that the financial benefits aren't there, but the esoteric benefits are completely there. The way that, the way that you can learn your craft, there's no substitute for being completely naked on stage with nothing but you and all the other actors. Figuratively. Yeah. You, you all know what I meant. Hey, I mean, I don't do what I we're meant. not judging here. This is a judgment free yeah. zone. Yeah, we're not doing hair, but you know. Um, so it, when you learn things that way, you instinctively bring those same skills onto a film set. Got so it. you're in, okay. you're by doing theater, you're making an investment in yourself. But not only that, and this is what I also tell film students, the people that you meet doing this type of work, those are the people that you're going to be working with on and on and on mm -hmm. over and over and over again for the rest of your lives. So yes. in our in our film, some of the actors in our film, I've worked with them for well over a decade. And it was their first time on first camera. time on camera, but you'd never know it. And the reason is, is because they cut their teeth doing theater, learning how to act right. and yeah, and bringing that aesthetic to my set. And we spent many years getting to know them in the trenches right. because theater productions can take months right. and being able to trust them. Because when someone's in and out on your set in a day or two, yeah, you, know, you don't know. Yeah. Don't and know. there's a couple of things you said in there that really stuck out. I mean, we were talking about doing um, background work and ambiance work uh, before. And it's interesting to me because what a lot of people don't understand even about that is like, you can do that. Like in California, there are people who pay their bills doing that. I don't know if that's possible in Texas because of the way our rates are. Yeah. It's very difficult to do that. Yeah. But there are people who pay their bills in California just doing background work. But what's interesting, I would go do background work even after I had started my company. And so I was there looking for talent. You so never was, know who you're going to meet. That's the yeah. thing. 
And people didn't, I didn't, they didn't know who I was. I was an extra running around with a sword and I was doing my best job to make it look good, whatever my mm. role was on yeah. revolution or killer women or whatever show I was on. But the whole time I was watching how people reacted to stressful situations. I was watching how they reacted to late call, uh, late lunch times, late call times. Oh yeah. Uh, are they still putting in the work? Are they not putting in the work? So I know we're joking about some of that stuff. I think really. grabbing to all and sundry about it, being a bad exactly. player. <laughs> they don't know. I mean, you don't know who you're talking to. So like, yeah, I'll be on that set one day as a PA because I was, or PA or background because I was I had time off and I was bored. And then the next day I'm on another set and I'm the one doing the casting and mm. it's a paid gig. But people didn't know that. And it's very interesting to see how people move when they don't know who's watching. And so I right. tell people, if you're going to go do that stuff, if it's your friend's short, if it's a 48 hour film festival, which are my favorites to watch people on, because they crack at 24 hours, you see who they are after about 22 hours in, <laughs> that's when you see them. And so, have you all ever done one of those, one of the 48 hour film festival uh, projects? Have we? No, no a lot yeah. of our friends have been involved in it though. Yeah. And I have to say after 28 days on set, we're by the end, you're going. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I was so glad. And yeah, I, I think that that would probably be an, be an excellent exercise to teach yeah. people who they really are. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes. Yo. Oh, yes. Okay. So 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 get this. Get this. Okay. It's 2016 or 17, 16, 16. I, I broke my leg. All right. Sorry. Um. I. Ben asked me to do something. Uh, ben said he had to shoot, do uh, something to shoot. And he said, are you sure you want to go out there? I'm like, because he didn't have an extra camera person or whatever. Yeah. And, I, and I'm like, let me get me out of the house. Please kidnap me because this is just, I can't deal anymore. So we're in downtown Austin. I'm on the camera. And I know the shot I need to get. So I get all down on the ground with this construction thing on my leg. You no, know, I use for carpentry. <laughs> I am on the ground, horizontal with the camera shooting this, and I look at him. He's like, "You damn fool! What are you?" Doing? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Je Jennifer, Mrs. Washington is who I'm talking. It wasn't it? Was not my call. That was a decision that he made. I advised against it. That was chill. It was not me. Yes, wanna... but but it was, you know, you could say I was just bored, but at the same time, you got to find the people that are willing to do that. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah, you, you, you know, now I'm not going to go, go, I'm going to look at the microphone. I'm not going to do this again. Or I got to break a leg. I'm not going to do it again. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to do that again. That's good. It hurt. <laughs> you all say a couple of things i heard you say make sure you have a really solid story a really solid yes. script and well, i also heard you say yeah. make sure you have a good team of people around you oh, yes. so yeah. two well, two good negative critical. information you've already given us completely so go ahead i'm sorry <laughs> we had an incredible crew because guess what well, we're, we can afford to pay is it going to be making them rich <laughs> <laughs> they're not they're putting in these long hours yeah. sitting in traffic you know driving g grueling situations you know how it always have to turn off the ac because it, it, it's yes. making noise and it's the and middle of yep. june and so on and so forth i can't believe that these people were our rock i said you know we yep. were climbing everest together and they were like the sherpas carrying all the gear <laughs> just yep. putting I up mean, with them. Yeah, but, I mean, if you're going to do all that, especially if you're not getting paid, if you get paid at all, the story better be really good for me going uh, <laughs> yeah. to a snowstorm. <laughs> a story or I got to like you. I mean, it's either it's the relationship and you're just good people and I want to help or like, oh, man, this is going to do some real magic when people see it. It's got to be one or the other. If it's neither one of those, like, that's a rough time. Like, I've been I was on a project one time. I was running around in Texas. It's like 105 degrees outside, okay? Yep. In all black, tactical uniform, like the whole, like buttoned up, right? With rifles and charging the hill. I almost passed out and that project didn't even come out, okay? Oh no, that's the worst. 
I'm, I'm still a little bit salty about that. So, um, we're all cool, but I'm still, there's, there's a mo legitimate emotions inside of me right now that I'm going to have to go through some therapy, do some yoga, some deep breathing <laughs> to get rid of. But like, like, is it, and that's the thing with a lot of times with independent film, specifically independent film, there are a number of projects I've worked on that have never been released. Mm -hmm. But because I, I knew what they were I trying to do. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, yeah, some of them I'm glad didn't get released. At least two of them, I'm like, ooh, we, sh we shouldn't put that out ourselves. But I went out there because I liked the people and I wanted to help them. And it was fine. And those people, at least in Texas, Quite often when that happens, people are like, you know what? The next time you got something going on, man, give me a call. I got you. And so it's a whole lot of relationships like that. And you need those relationships here. If you don't have the Hollywood money, you have to have those relationships. Well, it's a relationship business. That's what, I mean, if you can't establish relationships with people, this is the wrong business for you to be in. Uh, Larissa is very fond of saying it's like the mafia. It's who you know. Well, well, I also yes. think it's who, like, it's who yeah. you like, it's who you respect, but it's also who you trust. And yes. furthermore, there's one more thing. I learned this a long time ago. I learned this when I was in the military and it completely carries over into what we're doing all here. Mm. Sometimes it's more important to know who you don't want to work with than who you do. Yes. Because <laughs> if, you let one, if you let one cancer in the clubhouse, they can screw everything up. Yeah. And that's why it's vitally important when you're working, when you're on set, mm -hmm. that you are carrying yourself in a way where, like you said, Ben, you never know who's watching. You're looking, you, what you're doing today is going to lay the groundwork for the work you do later on in life. And who you meet now potentially is going to people that you partner with. Down yes. the you, oh, uh, think about this, though, you know, because I'm thinking from, a, from her perspective. <laughs> if you're gonna spend all this time oh away from God. away from family, I get this all the time. Mm -hmm. You're damn right. Yeah, all yeah. the time. She's like, "What is it for? Does it go to What is it for? If you're gonna do all this, <laughs> what is it for?" She's watching it in there. <laughs> you do just like that. Hi, hi, Erica. <laughs> she does it exactly like that. She goes, what, "Who's doing it? Where's it going?" <laughs> I would be Mrs. Reddick. <laughs> Lady Erica Reddit. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yes, uh, sorry. Yeah, you, you guys are, are Mrs. Uh, Washington for her. <laughs> she threw anyway. something at me. <laughs> oh, my like I said, we're almost all married. So, yes, if you're going to spend all this time away from family, weekends, you, you, you work 50 hours a week, and you only see your, your family on weekends because everyone else is asleep when you get home, whatever, you better be really fucking special for me to get yeah. my ass away from whatever yeah to be on your set and and whatever Wh whether i don't like the story or not whether whatever it is i want to make sure that you yeah. you know it better be worth it basically well also you people are busy so like i tell people you know when i first started we had way less things to do so it's fine i had a lot of time to come help out on sets and i feel bad sometimes and i'm like sometimes i have to tell people like, i don't have time like I have my own projects to do. So if I'm gonna burn a whole weekend and you're not really sure why we're doing this or what you're gonna do with it after, I may not have time to show up. I'll look at it, I'll help you however I can, but I may not be able to come lend my physical time to that. So as you move up, people tend to have less time because you're just being more productive, you know, so. And I would like to add to that too. So often casting is dependent on, in our level, it's gonna be, Who's going to show up? <laughs> <laughs> we had this, we had a huge cast, oh, um, much larger than most indie films, but we were handling so much with pre-production and locations and paperwork and insurance and taking, getting our crew, getting our props, getting our, you know, everything that we had to do uh, to make sure all our departments were set ready to go. Then when we were casting, you know, we, there were a couple people that we knew Mm -hmm. And kind of as a favor, it was, hey, do you want a couple lines in this scene? It shoots at this time and this date and whatever. Oh my, okay. And then when you have those people decide, ah, oh, yeah, you know, I'm too busy. I can't do it after committing to do it. And it's like, okay, you wasted my time. I put out call sheets with all your info. I put out this list. I had the paperwork all done. 
now you're going to make me go recast this role. We Where's... have long memories. Oh, yes. Oh. Versus, versus the, you know, someone who you know, I needed to cast a role. He showed up with for a rehearsal with his brother, uh, and I found out he was an actor. Charming guy. And like, hey, you want to roll in this? You're going to show up for me? You got it. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's how some people get their, their first acting role. They just showed right. up. They were well, there. They up. were available. Check this out. <laughs> I literally. Success is showing up. I literally that's half had. Of life. I had that same exact thing happen, and one of my friends might watch this, so he might you know, know what I'm talking about. But it was like, I will never forget, we did this military short, and I had two friends, they're like, one guy, I was like, you know, he never gets to be the hero, I'm gonna write him in as a hero. And then I had another friend who was like, never got any lines, I was like, cool, I wrote this for you, you're ex-military, I'm giving you lines. And on the day, it was scheduled to maybe drizzle a little bit, which to me is like, great, clouds, perfect, we'll make it work. Yep. Apparently to them, it was like, we're not coming, deal's off. So my two guys, who were supposed to be the two most important people, didn't show up. Luckily, for whatever reason, the Lord was like, Ben, wear your combat boots and your fatigues to set, just in case just in case something goes wrong. So now I had to re I had to rewrite the whole thing. Then instead of just being able to shoot and direct it, I had to be in it yeah. because there was no one who could carry the, the action to the level that I wanted. And so I have literally had that happen and it was a vi and I'd never forgot it. This is probably like 2020. This is like 2016, 2017. And it's like vivid in my mind the entire situation. So absolutely, like when you say you're gonna show up to do something for somebody and people go through all that trouble and they're like, especially as like a director and you're doing multiple things, like man, got that booked, yes. On to the next thing. And then it's like, no wait, that's not done. We gotta go back over there. That is a, that is a hard uh, experience to have. You it's definitely wanna have people, that, go ahead. No, you go. Go ahead. You definitely want to have people that are committed to doing what they've said that they're going to do. So you all have talked about like your network. You talked about the script. I, I wanted to ask you, so when you have your, whenever you had your script from the beginning, did you already have in mind, because I know your film comes out on Amazon tomorrow, October 30th, the film October comes 30th. out tomorrow, everybody. Yep, The Best um, Adventures of Mistress Man-Eater. Yes. It's a movie. movie. Say it one more time, because we were talking all at the same time. Say it one more time. The Misadventures <laughs> of Mistress Maneater. Amazon yes. Prime. When you that alliteration nice. had your script at the beginning, were you thinking about distribution at the end already? I was not. I um, was. Oh, okay. Well, I'm more of a business end of okay. things than Larissa. Okay. Did. So that's that's another thing that we really have to talk about because yes. you know you've got it's show business. So half of it is show, the other half is business. And the business end of things is really, really hard. The show business, the show part of it is really hard. <laughs> Making a movie is hard. Making yes. a feature length movie is really hard. And no matter how many sets you've been on, because Craig and I have been on a lot of sets all the way from, you know, big television and Hollywood to small sets, to student films, to everything in between, until you actually do it, you have no clue. <laughs> no, 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 you have to do it. So yes, I mean, yeah. so, so this, this, is, this is an excellent thing that you brought up, Keisha. Um, we funded this movie ourselves, So um, we, we started this off by flipping a house and doing that. We put in the sweat equity to get the funding and make the money that we needed to, that we thought we needed to do this movie. Oh, wow. And oftentimes when, when I meet filmmakers or writers or whatever, you know, they, they've got this great idea, but do you know anybody who give me money? Do you know anybody, do you know any angel investors? You know, and, and the, the thing is, is like, we felt from the very start that if we did crowdfunding or Kickstarter or whatever, that is literally an invitation for investors to go the opposite way at hundred miles an hour. Mm. We okay. did not want to do, we felt it was beneath us. We oh. thought it would demean us. We thought it would diminish, diminish our project. And when we put our own money into this, I went into this with the idea 
that we were going to put it out to the public and do everything within our power to make our money back and then some. But we also didn't want to be dependent on other people that way. We didn't want our project to live or die on 10, 15 bucks that our fellow struggling artists could or couldn't give us. Because yeah. we had seen so many projects die on the vine over the years and years and years that people have used Kickstarter. It was unique right. at first and now it just looks like you don't have it any money. It looks like desperation to us. And the other thing is, is, you know, when you're an actor, performer, director, whatever it is, when you're in this business and you're going to actors to ask them for money, actors, actors don't have any money. <laughs> Come on. Typically, you know, yeah. They typically don't have any money. No. So. And it also made us more careful with how we spent our money to make sure that we were doing ours. everything we could do. So for, for ex oh, you were going to say something down there, chill. Yeah. Yeah. Uh the old rule does it end up on screen Wh whatever you buy yep. you see it up there yep. otherwise don't do it precisely yeah. well i've had this conversation since um after my trailer came out of, mm -hmm. of a filmmaking colleague asked me so where'd you get the money and i said well we raised it ourselves and it was it, it looks compared to what people have said it looks like maybe the budget was maybe 10 percent of what it looks like to some people, it may be 25% uh, of what it looks like to other people. Yeah, I um, had a critic say that it looked like we spent at least a million dollars on our movie. And Larissa and I looked at each other and we're like, yay! <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my, my point about this filmmaker, and, and I said, we, ra we made it, we raised it ourselves, and there's so much you can shoot for a lot less than you think. So fortunately, we had Suzette Brown, our line producer, who was experienced with low budget indies and could say all oh, right this is how we make this look bigger this is how you know this is this person will work for this amount of money if it's only this many days they're solid they're, you know all of that right. this person comes with their own equipment and this was also a union was it union all the way through or so, was it okay. this was sag you will be so you can have mixed okay. cast okay so above two hundred fifty thousand dollars, it has to be i believe it's right. sag modified low and so right. it has or low budget so it has to be all sag so that's when you have your hallmark and lifetime movies with only a cast of six or eight so we have a huge cast very much a mixed cast got it um, the most important thing for you when you were thinking about the budget what what was the biggest thing that you had on your mind well you know what's interesting is is that when we first started we had a we had a partner uh, we met a guy, we went, were, was it a Sundance? No, it was it. It was in LA. It was in LA. So we went to LA for some filmmakers conference and we met a fella and, uh, he was an entrepreneur businessman in, uh, what, what Dubai. Dubai and, uh, apparently worth, he was an actor, had some money. And then we struck up a friendship, read the script, loved it. And we thought, you know what, let's partner with him. We'll, we'll, we'll partner with him. He'll have the lead role as Radovan. He'll put some money into the budget. We'll put money into the budget. This was and also when I was scared of us putting in 100%. Yeah. <laughs> so I kind of, I, I needed this person to commit just so I felt like, okay, we're half and half. Yeah. I could be a little safer. Well, three yeah. months before we started shooting, he dropped out and said, I'm not going to be in it and we're not going to give you the money. So all of a sudden, the money that we had had to go a lot. Further. Had to go a lot further, exactly. And to make, to make matters even more interesting, we paid people. We did. So I feel very strongly as a professional that while we may not be able to pay people a lot of money, we feel mm -hmm. that we should pay people some money for for what they're doing just to show that we appreciate them and that we're trying to do the right thing. Yeah. If we can make our movie successful and make our money back and get into profit, we're going to bonus our crew, but we have to get to that point first. So we, we went from having enough money to not having enough money. And then I had to, I had to go into my own, my own pocket. We went to Larissa's mom who, gave us a loan. And that's how we funded the film. We still did not go outside myself, Larissa and her mom to make this movie. And when we're marketing it, I went, I went into one of my 401k plans to take money out for the marketing because we're, we have an actual marketing budget. Mm -hmm. That's another portion that indie filmmakers don't realize is that you can make your movie, but then you got to get people to want to watch it. Yeah, I've had, yeah. Yeah, That's I've had, marketing. I've had friends that are like, "Oh, I'm getting a, a real job. I'm I, I feel like I'm a I'm a trader. I'm giving Selling up on my dreams." And I'm like, "Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Wait a minute!" 
you now are going to have the power, you know, yeah, you might be able to have to have to take a break from acting for a couple of years, but you're going to be able to save so much money so you can write your own ticket and decide what you're going to do. If you can save that, you're not going to be living in mama's basement, you know, it should not be able to rub together 10 cents anymore. You're going to have more freedom. You're going to have more autonomy if you can save that. So, you know, you suffer now by not being able to be involved with your art, but you will have more freedom and independence and choices later. You can buy your own equipment. I mean, yeah. that, we have, I mean, like our, even having our own batteries for the camera and be able to go out and buy an extended battery and things like that, the things that we needed um, to yeah. make the shoot work. You got to have a long game. I do definitely think that um, you should have a level of autonomy when it comes to the financing. I am, I'm, I'm, I'm of the mixed camp. We have never done anything we did not have our own money involved in, but I've seen a lot of people be successful using crowdfunding and different methodologies, even if it's not for the money, for the marketing side, because it gives people something to, something to promote. I agree. But there's that. a, there's so, a number of, you know, it will be seen. Your money isn't going into the void to never be heard from again. Exactly. And so it, the thing is like, if you go your route, you just got to be ready for Get rid of all those dots and willing to take that hit. If you go the other route, you better have some really good relationships and either have a fan base already to, to start the, these crowdfunding and these Kickstarters. Because one of the things that people don't know about a lot of a lot of those even is that they're planned. So someone might have personally raised 30, 40 percent of their income already of their budget before they started their Kickstarter. So they've already got those people built in to be those big time investors and then they help like super you know ex expand the viewer the viewership and a lot of other people kick in for the other 60 percent plus you normally have to have already developed your crowd base before you do something like that if you're yeah. just going in raw you're a first time filmmaker you don't know anybody you don't have any followers and you're just going to do a kickstarter you're you are just begging from your fellow filmmakers and friends and they will well, they give you like 15 20 dollars but it's probably not going to do the 100k or 200k you need to make that feature film but That's i like what you all were just saying about make sure you have a plan like make yes. sure because you said your investor pulled out if you all like if, if you all didn't even have your own money and you're putting your faith in this <clears throat> other person and then they pull out then you have yeah. nothing you all had to try to after he left try to piece things together but I, that, you that's had something crazy. to piece together. Yeah, well, like, <laughs> here, here's also something on the opposite side, using your example. Um, I have a friend that he got a, he had, you know, bees definitely ground floor on everything, wants to build everything himself, doesn't want to take any money, etc. Mm -hmm. He got offered and received all of this gear, software, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that He's beholden to the person that gave him all the hardware and software. Mm. Exactly. So, 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 if you try to pivot, even though using the common sense, you know, whatever, and this other person does not, <laughs> when you try to say that very same thing to them, they can say, "No, you're going to be doing this." Yeah. Yeah. So less autonomy. Yeah. Yeah. You got to know the deal, even for your distribution. You got to know the deals. But I'll agree what you said, Ben, is that when I have seen the Kickstarters and the Indiegogos, and I've been in films that have done that for their marketing, they have a finished project. They can show, look, we used our money. We used it well. We didn't go off, you know, take your money and go off on a binge somewhere. <laughs> you know, because sometimes, you know, the movie, it never I've, made I've seen that too. Out. I've We've seen that too. That. Yeah. We have seen that. But, there are <laughs> horror stories about people going out as disguised as filmmakers and they pocket the 50 grand and you never hear from them again. Yeah. But, you know, you yeah. see that these people, they finished a film, which is a yeah. huge accomplishment. And then to be able to say, hey, we need a little bit of help to get it to the next level, but it's already done. This movie is going to happen. It's just yeah. up to you donating as our friends how far it can go. Yeah. That I am much more inclined to donate to yeah. personally as well. Yeah. But I, I've, seen, I've seen one they've, they've, they've raised. I'm not even going to say any names because I'm actually a fan, but they raised like a hundred grand to make this show i really wanted to watch we got like two episodes 
and then they disappeared. And I was like, what? Oh, no. It was like a, it wasn't like a, you know, someone died and we can't do it anymore. It was like, it was a ghost. Like people were like, I, cause I would go to the page and I'm like, well, yeah. what happened? And they're like, Hey, what's going on with that project that I funded? Nothing. Oh, that's heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah that's right. And also, I think that it's if people want to go the crowdfunding route, I think it's important from my perspective to be transparent, to show this is where your money is going. Oh, yes. Because then people could say, all right, this is where it is needed and your people aren't being wasteful. So I've seen a lot of waste when the money isn't coming out of the creator's own pockets. Oh, yeah. Um, and then they <clears> run out of money you know, and they can't finish the project, whatever it is. The, uh, the filmmaker who came to me and said, how did you get your money? How did you get your money? He said, well, we did it ourselves and we did it very, very inexpensively and yes. you know, made, but basically made the $10 thrift store dress look like a hot couture in many ways. Because <laughs> nobody, people aren't frugal with other people's credit cards. No, nope, exactly. And I, so he had a Kickstarter um, Indiegogo thing going on and he's, his, the budget he wanted to raise was 2 million. Mm. And I said, why do you need $2 million for this? Because I thought I would need a lot more money for ours and our between our, us and our line producer, we found out no, we we could do it for the money we had. Well, right. only because we did so much. We did so ourselves. much ourselves. And I said, why does it have to be two million? Why does it have to be two million? He said, well, I I, I deserve to get paid. I want to be able to pay myself something. <laughs> Can you for believe you said that? And I was thinking, why should anyone go give you hundreds of thousands of dollars so you can pay oh. yourself for your own passion project when you're not a tried, you know, director with That's a, I didn't say that. Yeah. But that's his proof of concept <laughs> was awful. Well, my point was is that <laughs> his film never got made <sighs> because you know he was he was attached to that amount of money. Right. Yeah. And I mean, if anybody's gonna take a hit, it's it's gonna be you. Fine. <laughs> if anybody's not gonna get paid on set. It, yes. On your movie, it it's gonna it's gonna be you. It should be you. It better be you. They have some egos. They're like, no, I'm getting something mm, out of this. There's devos. Like, this, all these people are coming oh, yeah. together for you. So, <laughs> it, it, and I'm finna get paid. No. So actually, one of the things you mentioned about crowdfunding, we've been doing uh, some stuff with with kick with a uh, seed and spark actually. So Seed and Spark works kind of like uh, Kickstarter, but one of the things that's cool is that they have, uh, you say, ex it is transparent. You talk about exactly what it is you need to get your project finished. So I can say, mm -hmm. I need a ranch for this one scene and it's gonna cost me $1,000. And someone can give me the $1,000 or someone could also say, hey, I have a ranch you could use. Hey, I have a camera you can borrow. Hey, I I can do that role, or I can do the thing, so you don't have to spend the money. And I was like, that's that is wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, up, it's amazing, it's amazing. It's big. You brought up something interesting. I have a camera. Now on our set, we we often did multi camera shoots mm -hmm. for time for time, and, and yeah. it was it was a huge benefit. However, once we got to post, we were shooting with Black Magics. So okay. we shot with a new Black Magic and we shot with an older model Black Magic. Mm. Just one model apart. And one model apart. And then occasionally we would have a Panasonic camera. Yes. Oh. All of the color signatures were different. Even though they were yeah. programmed the same way, they still mm -hmm. turned out different. Actually, I think we had more, um, my colorist who is our uh, DP and co-producer, John Wesley Norton, had more issues matching the two black magics. Yeah, they don't match as well as I would have liked them to match. We have two black magics as well. Wow. Right. So in they the future, what, what's really important, especially if you're doing multi-camera shoots, this is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. We are going to purchase identical cameras yep. with identical software mm -hmm. and identical cards, everything. Lenses. That would save an enormous amount of time and effort oh. and labor in post. And if I have the budget, which I intend to, I want to have probably three or four Black Magics all the same so I can have the next scene being set up with the nice. extra cameras. That's what took so long was the right. we had lighting a, set up. Oh, that was I mean, one of the biggest things I'm noticing now because we had an amazing production designer um, 
Crystal, and she, she actually was the sister of our line producer and sister-in-law of our of our uh, second male lead, <laughs> Shannon Brown. So kept it all in the family. Wow. But just the difference she made. I mean, I mean, setups took a little longer than they might on a regular indie shoot. But the every shot was beautiful because it was no longer. I see in so many indie films that we're even up against in in film fests. There's nothing on the walls. Put stuff on the walls. <laughs> <laughs> which, which brings us do something. So I'm going to use that to segue. One, we did the same thing. We started off with Canon T3Is hacked with Magic Lantern. Those are the first cheapest cameras. They said, get that in a 50. So that was our first set. And I made sure to buy two because we do a tremendous amount of action. And you may, it may never look exactly the same. And we don't have a lot of time. So I almost always run two cameras. Then we got the Black Magic in the 2K, and it kind of matches close enough. Then we got a GH5 S. Then we got another Black Magic, and we realized the two Black Magics don't match up as much as I would have liked them to match up. So then we ended up getting, we have three GH5s so that we don't have those color grading issues and trying to match everything up, like balancing. Because that honestly is the one thing I dislike the most about editing anything and it takes the longest and I never, I I just don't enjoy it. So you know what, we're going to get the same cameras, do multi-camera setups every single time Mm -hmm. and just rock and roll for for some. But you mentioned something about set design. So understand that uh, you went a little renaissance in this movie. We know you're, you're very talented, polymath, you got all these skill sets, Larissa. Uh, apparently you're also an artist and you paint. Yeah, I picked that up during the recession. There was <laughs> a lot of work going on. So I was like, um, I think that um, I'm going to you know, be a painter. Well, and- let me bra- I'm going to brag a little bit here. As Larissa, you should. Larissa painted the painting as the centerpiece of the film. Now, Ben, you saw it. The and Keisha, you saw it, right? Did you watch yes, it? I've seen yes, it. Yes, I've seen it. Oh, you okay. saw the movie as well. Okay, great. Yes, definitely. The painting is the centerpiece of the uh, of the mystery of is supposed to be this Baroque lost masterpiece. Right. From the early 1600s. From the early 1600s. Larissa painted that. <laughs> and... Oh, you went back in time. Dang. Yeah. <laughs> Got some Avenger stuff going on. Go ahead. Now, this is where it gets good. <laughs> Larissa does not have one day of art training. What? Not one day. But I do have a lot of practice because I've been painting for She's being a modest. Long. She <laughs> thinks that way. It, it's it's like in her. And she understands. That's awesome. Yeah. So you should see the paintings on our walls and the paintings she sold. All She's those amazing. years of face painting to pay the bills paid off somehow. Because <laughs> I believed it. When I saw it, I be- I'd never questioned, oh my God, that's not a real Baroque. I never That never crossed my mind. We also got a treat during the film where she started singing. I was like, Yes, yes. I'm like, where, where did that come from? What we, the- we <laughs> knew, oh my God. Six years opera. You, yeah, we <laughs> saw your painting, so we knew that you painted, and then of course you were acting, and then you started singing. I was like, like Oh my goodness, this lady is talented and yeah. crazy talented. <laughs> that's three. Writing, that's four. That's a lot. Oh, yes. The writing a lot happening. Well, it, it was wow. nice to finally have something in the, which I, I felt I could fully spread my wings as an artist and fire on all cylinders for a change instead of, oh, you know, a couple lines and people don't get to see who I am and what makes my heart sing, which is all of these disciplines as uh, that all feed storytelling. Okay, yeah. so you, you just brought this out. Now, you, this other side. So where did you learn the Wu-Tang? Where, where, where did you start learning how, how to fight? And, oh, uh, yeah. There, there's a story. <laughs> Austin <for> Action <laughs> Fest. I get to it. I encouraged her to do it to start. So, so. Uh, well, let me back yeah. up a little bit. So, in 2008, um, I was start, starting off in my career, and my first, uh, I had this audition. It was non union at the time, it was for Midway Games for Mortal Kombat oh. versus DC Universe. Ooh. And I said, I want to do this. I, I still want to do this. I want to, I've always wanted to be a superhero or this would be so exciting. I knew nothing about Mortal Kombat at the time. So I decided I want to dress the part. So Craig and I go to DSW and he gets me the, you know, the knee high boots that I wore in the movie because I do not get rid of clothes. Oh, okay. I'm very thrifty. So I wore those boots and I had this cut off top and a sword on my back and the cut off jeans and all that. And, you know, so I'm looking and looking like the part and everybody else is in sweats and I'm looking like, God, I feel like a fool. 
And I, I go, go in there and I'm being um, auditioned by Dominic and John, the, the directors and the writers at the, um, of that particular piece. And uh, you know, I'm trying to say the lines and they're like, Larissa, put the sword down. <laughs> So I, I, my heart really went out to Wonder Woman in the movie when it's like, you know, Diana put the sword down. I'm like, yes! <laughs> <laughs> but I got cast. I'm like, I'm, there's no way I'm getting cast in this. I got cast. So I was, um, the K Katana and Sonya did the motion capture for those characters in that. Right. And I ended up working on Mortal Kombat 9 and 10 and 11 and Injustice 1 and 2 and, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, but a few years into it, because I love working with them. I don't even, I'm not even a gamer. I, you know, I watch the, the cut scenes once. The, uh -huh. like Tetris. <gasps> no, you, you play Tetris. Yeah. You play Catan. You know, Catan. Yeah, Settlers of Catan. That's what we yeah. play at the restaurant over, <laughs> over sushi or whatever. Um, but a couple of years into it, like, I absolutely love working with these animators. They're amazing, wonderful people. I want to keep this going as long as possible. Craig's like, you know, you should really probably take some martial arts because I believe at the time, um, none of us actors had martial arts training, except for maybe uh, Steven Scalabrino. And uh, I was like, oh, but, uh, yeah, uh, you know, I was never sportsy. I was never athletic. I had only oh. just started being um, d being a gym rat and doing strength training and all of that sort of thing. Got but it. I was like, okay, I'll start taking something at the park district. Fine. What do they have? Uh, they have one martial arts class, Shotokan karate. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's, let's go to that. Yeah. And, and I walk in and there's this, my, my sensei is this very serious, stoic Serbian gentleman. And I trained under him for six years. And wow. I, was, I was the class clown and he always just very patiently put up with my antics. And now he's <laughs> encouraging her to get her black belt. Yes, so I saw yeah. a brown belt. Yes, yeah, so she's and it, brown and belt, huge, okay. But it was yeah. a huge benefit to my work with, um, motion capture and performance capture, but ultimately it's what inspired the story. So if anything, I would tell you know, your listening audience that you know maybe they're in their 20s, or maybe they're just starting out and that they're impatient for that success. They want it to happen. But guess what? Everything you do, everything you learn of your crafts, whether it's for me, it was singing, years of painting and being a gallery artist because performance work wasn't out there for me, uh, mm -hmm. learning uh, Shotokan, for years, all the things I've, I've done and learned and the skills I've picked up mm -hmm. went into making this movie the way it was. I could not have made this movie this way five years ago or 10 years ago. I right. wouldn't have the expertise and the skill personally to do it. I try to tell people all the time that like you, you can't write really things that you don't know anything about very well. That's why normally people write, they write the stuff that they know. That's right. So yes. You don't go outside your bubble and you don't try different things and have different um, experiences out here. Like you're not pulling from a very deep well of creativity. Like I'm writing, I have an idea right now. It's like a movie about playing paintball. Well, the reason I have the idea to do that movie is because I went to go play paintball mm -hmm. and it was amazing, right? Paintball's like, fun. I get to dress up and shoot people and run around in forms. <laughs> yeah, why did I not do this earlier? Right. And so right. because of that, the ideas come from this experience that I'm having. I did martial arts and did dance and stuff as a kid. So because of that, I get ideas from those things. And if you don't go out and live and read and listen to stories, and That's right. you, you, you don't have as diverse a palette to pull from. That is completely true, especially as a writer. Um, you, people are saying, why do you have these gala scenes? I'm like, I write what I know. I work at galas as a model and a performer and whatnot. That is what I know. And that's the biggest thing I miss during COVID is, right. I, you know, when I would go and do these events dressed up as a statue in full right. paint and all that or whatever I would do at a museum, like the people I listen to, the experiences mm. I have, the stories mm. I have to tell, mm. that feeds my writing. Oh, and that yeah. feeds me as an actor and a performer. Like you said, it yeah. makes you this multidimensional being. Yeah, and, and I found is that the older that you get, the, the richer your writing gets. Mm. You know, I, I started writing in my teens, preteen teens, and, you know, finish something had my, my 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 mom read it to my dad. Um, the result was the thing they said that, that it was crap. <laughs> um, but that was and that's because 
I'm 14 years old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't want to show you, you my gonna... scripts from when I was 14. Yeah, believe yeah, me. Yeah, you know, I, I, I will say it. I can there say no, this. There were no arcs in my stories <laughs> from the kid. The dude was amazing in the beginning, and he just got more amazing as the progressed. <laughs> no arcs. I, I, learned nothing. I, 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 I knew enough to where to where you can't be the same person at the beginning to the end. I mean, I had no story had that I've seen had had, had a uh, loss of a baby in it. You know, Ooh. this is you know, I, I this is at 14, 15 years old. I had all that. Wow. You know, and, and they're like, you know, they still like, okay, this sucks, but what's this? <laughs> now, umpteen years later, as far as COVID goes, what I miss is voice acting. <laughs> That's what I, I mean. I I can't up, upgrade this room in the way I, I, I want to. I, I need some stuff to do it. But at the same time, I miss being in the booth. Yeah. You know, yeah. I miss, you know, going, hi, my name is Chalimboy. <laughs> yes. Oh my god. So I, I do have another question about the action. Yes, action. Any okay, so okay, story. okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I know, it's, yeah. So as far as the rest of your cast, yes. Um, what was what was the the situation with the martial arts for the rest of the cast? I know there's some stories in there. Well, we knew we needed a great choreographer. Um, to make sure things looked as realistic as possible. We've all seen poorly shot, poorly executed fight scenes. And even though this is a romantic comedy, I'm like, I, we wanted everything to be top notch, to be like, yeah. holy, you know, when you see it, that it makes a good impression. Everything has good action scenes. Family Guy, uh, I think I saw Bet, Bet the House or whatever, it was a comedy movie, and they were doing these crazy martial arts. I was like, why does every movie, now, like, doesn't matter what the genre is. The action's good. So yeah, you gotta you gotta keep up with the Joneses. Okay, so so how do you keep whoever trained you? How do you keep you from getting hurt? Oh uh, well, I, um, my sensei was not involved in the shoot, and fortunately, I really didn't have any hand to hand on you know with anybody. Though at the end, my poor scene partner did end up with a very sore neck for about a week. Yes, he, yes, he, <laughs> he was not accustomed to studs, even with a, a mattress. And um, I had forgotten because I've been throwing myself into a mattress for the last 12 years in various forms and I'm just used to it. Like, you just you just throw yourself backwards into a mattress. Yes, your body's not used to hitting the ground a lot. You're oh, yeah. Mm. Uh, so it's still I, a violent move to yes. get jerked and slammed, yeah. Well, we had a wonderful uh, fight choreographer, um, uh, Brian Barber. Okay well known here in the Chicago market here and we've worked on other films with him so he was someone that we trusted who under we talked about the vision he understood what we needed and mm -hmm. he worked with our leading man Mickey O'Sullivan in advance trained you know figured out nice. the, the limits of his abilities what he was uh, good at and uh, then we met up the weekend before because we had a film um, two MMA scenes in the same night because mm -hmm. we had 80 extras so there was no way we, even though we should have split it up over two nights, mm -hmm. uh, fortunately we had a three camera setup because nice. like you said, there's no real way to, to cut that and make it look great. And not to mention the time it would need and you would exhaust your fighters. Yes. So then the nice thing about this was too, is that he was cast as uh, the MMA fighter of, that was the opponent to our leading man. Right, right. So it kind of cut out one one Got person it. needing communication. So he could be the leader and he could lead that dance as it were and be this amazing fighter as well. That's awesome. So if you had to, is there anything you learned about fight choreography or uh, maybe something that you discovered during the shooting of this that maybe you didn't think about before? Yes, yes, definitely. Don't take for granted what your actors are are willing and able and feel comfortable doing. Yeah, we had we had a situation with our lead actor who he I think we visited about this yesterday. He's a hockey player, so he's very, very confident with grabbing somebody's collar and doing boom, boom, boom. But you know, that was it. And, <laughs> he, did, he did some great punches. He did well, some great moves. <laughs> but that's, that's not my point though. My point is is that um, they did the they did the fight choreography ahead of time, and then Larissa right. and I went in for the final two rehearsals. And our lead actor was not a trained karate or martial arts guy, so he was not flexible enough to do kicks. 
Got it. And um, as I was watching what they'd come up with, I realized very quickly that this wasn't mixed martial arts. It was a boxing match. And that was my fault because I'm the karate background. I like flashy kicks and I wanted everything <laughs> to stay upright because I don't have the MMA background as much as Shoto. So it was so literally it wasn't going to happen. And I realized that as a director that the fight scene that we had, the, the way they choreographed it was mm -hmm. going to be very repetitive. Got um, it. You know, it was going to be jab, hook, you know. And it was all on the same level. All, all on the same level. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Yeah, you have to get really. I've I've done a couple of boxing ones. You to do boxing if you're not a boxer is interesting because right. you, you gotta you have to get really creative with what they're doing and how they're doing it because you only have so many you only have so many maneuvers that you're going to do in boxing. So yeah, you're right. Right, right. So um, when I was in high school, I was a wrestler, and I do have martial arts from my time in the military. Although I'm older now, I can't really, I'm, I'm not really going to do all of the fight choreography, but I realized that we needed some levels. So the one thing that Mickey could do that we could put in is some grappling moves. Got it. And, you know, grappling falls into what judo is, frankly. And uh, so it worked and we were able to give the fight some, uh, some measure of levels Got so it. Where it wasn't going to be too repetitive and we could and also it. up and then down and yeah, yeah. Like that's what i mean by shot. levels that's what i mean by levels exactly. so, so um what? everybody has a different skill level and when we were casting this we we realized very quickly that what we needed for the part of Radavan is we needed an actor who could be taught how to fight and who versus, was willing and who, comfortable and who was willing it versus getting a fighter who couldn't act. We yeah, that's, act. Ooh, that is a you rough know, one. <laughs> it's a rough one, you know? And when we found Mickey, we were told by many, many people that we would never find him in Chicago, like Larissa said mm. earlier, and we did. And, you know, we, we, you know, we did whatever we could to get him up to speed yeah. and he got himself physically fit. He was doing two a day CrossFit right. for two hours nice. each to yeah. get into shape and he did a wonderful job for us and a truly committed actor yeah and, you know, the fight scenes were compelling enough would i would have liked to have more in them yes Got it. but given what we had and what we had to do and the time constraints we had it was literally the best that we could get out of those actors under the circumstances and i like good so well, that's something that's very obvious to all of us who have filmed action scenes, but that your listening audience might not be as aware of the time it takes, the time <laughs> it takes to rehearse, the time it takes to film it yes. and the time it takes to edit it. I mean, those, it, it, those were the scenes that took us the longest to film and the longest to cut. Um, like we had, so we had a one night, one day, it was everything, all of the conversations that took place in his office and we'd use a dual camera setup. We'd shot nine pages in one day. Nice. Whereas uh, the fight that took place outside the building when he's jumped by several thugs, that just that fight, which was a few seconds and you know, maybe this much on a page took all night. So that's one warning I would give and that I'm thinking of as a producer for the next film of like, okay, I have to be sure I know how many fight scenes I have and figure out each one could take a day or more to shoot. Yep. Not to mention not only possibly needing a choreographer as well as a stunt coordinator, needing protective equipment, whatever yeah. it is that you need. Yeah. And also think scheduling. If you're working, like for us, we, we were, work, were very concerned about any injury that Mickey might sustain, because especially the-, the If he got injured, fight. we were done. So we scheduled yeah. all the fights on the very last day of shooting. Mm, oh, that, that is some, so that smart. smart. That's very some smart. foresight. And there's a couple of things in there you said that were very good. One, because um, I've done this a lot. Like I've been asked to create choreography for a fight and then I make all this stuff up and it's like a Kung Fu fight and it's all great. And then I get to the, with the part, the actor and I'm like, oh, so you, you got someone who's never done Kung Fu before. They did uh -huh. boxing. And I'm like, if you tried to get that person to do Jeet Kune Do on the day, mm, someone's going to get punched in the eye. It was going to get done. It's going to be a very real fight. Oh, yeah. Not part of the plan. And so a lot of it, 
what you did there was genius in the fact that you were, all right, okay, so what are, what are you capable of doing? And then let's build right. around that. That is very good. Also, when with the stunts, like the more advanced your stunts get, the more time and the more risk of injury. And literally, I have been on sets where a guy will flip off a building, he's fine. He gets, he rolls in the grass, dislocates his shoulder, shut the set down. Yep. Yep. You know, like you just flipped off a building. What do you mean you dislocated your shoulder rolling in the grass? Those were the most stressful days for me was wondering, please, nobody get hurt. Please, nobody get hurt. Please, exactly. nobody get hurt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And from the very start right. when we made the schedule, we knew flat out that the last night of shooting was going to be fights because that way we knew that we could get everything else shot. And if he got injured at a certain point throughout the fight scenes, at least we could cobble something together. Yeah. Right. But we needed to make sure that that movie was shot. And that was part of the reason, too, why it was so advantageous for us to have Brian Barber, our choreographer, be his opponent. Because if we had had two actors who were not used to fighting, trying Mm -hmm. to fight each other, there would have been so much more risk of injury. And that was not something we wanted to take. So we knew, okay, the choreographer who knows this inside and out, who is used to this, will be much safer with our leading man. Plus, yeah. plus your leading man is more comfortable with him. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, they've been working which, together. Which is, exactly, which is right. a whole other thing. So I'm, I'm curious. So if they were doing that, that means you two were the second unit directors. If he's in the scene, he's not directing. So you two are still directing the action, right, CJ? I was directing the action. Larissa was... Okay. Okay. So C- magic. Yeah. yeah. So CJ, so you're your you regular director and second unit director. Um, what is interesting? Also, something that you said that I forget often because we do so much action is that there are techniques and tricks to cutting an action sequence together. Yeah. yeah. That dropping a frame. Oh my God! Yeah. Like most people don't know like when to cut, where to cut. Cutting a frame, small speed ramps. Um, the fact that normally, if you don't have like real legitimate martial artists, kicks are always slow. Yep. So there are certain things you do to cut a frame out of a kick before impact. And so it's, it's very interesting to hear you say this because a lot of people don't know. And they think, oh, well, you know, somebody could come in and shoot it and then I'll just go edit it. And it's like, yeah, but there's a skill set to, to those sorts of things. And it's not unlearnable. But you just got to respect the fact there's a little bit of craft in there. Yes. And I won't claim to be the most experienced um, cutter when it comes to that, since this was my first time doing action scenes. And I certainly learned a lot going in, going into it. But yeah, I mean, you see like the initial footage and then you see, you see my cut. And then I'm like, nope, it's still going slow. <laughs> How do we cut some frames here? How do we speed this up by 10%? How do we drop yeah. a frame there just to keep, you know, make it look even more brutal than exactly. it is? Uh, and then you just look at it so many times to figure out where does it look less mm-hmm. than perfect. Uh, one place that I struggled with as an editor sometimes was when there was an impact. Mm-hmm. And if it was something dramatic, like a kick to the face, the actor had to be, you know, two or three feet away from the other actor in the yep. moment. And I had to figure out, all right, how am I going to, you know, do I cut back to a wide ang- angle? Sometimes I had to make uh, band-aid certain things to show <laughs> that an impact wasn't happening. But I, w- I will add one more thing as well. The, what took the most time was not cutting the visuals. That took mm-hmm. long enough. The audio. Oh, Yeah. Oh my goodness. The, the swishes and this small, oh yeah. Oh my, so this is, this, is, this is like the one time that he drove me nuts in the editing suite. I'm glad he did. But there aren't a lot of sound effects that you can get for punches. And they all sound the same. So we got this whole library of punches and they all sounded the same or it sounded like someone stomping on dry yeah. leaves. Like that's not a punch. So I, and we had to layer punches. I had to, I, I adjusted mm-hmm. the speed and the pitch of mm-hmm. each sound so it could sound a little different if I only had- Did you do any Foley? Yes. Did you, did, did you break, break some uh, celery? <laughs> <laughs> I did do a little Foley, though, though with none, mm-hmm. none with vegetables involved. Yeah. So I, I think I, I, after I'd done all these layers, like some um, punches mm-hmm. actually, because we, we had a uh, someone helping out with all of that as well. 
Um, and he layered some of the sound effects on top of each other. So maybe there'd be just a frame off, just to have a different sound sometimes, or your volume, obviously the closer the shot, the louder the volume has to be. That was another thing I, I figured out was, um, cause we had a crowd, then we had the, the noises they were making and then the noises of the punching and the music and yep. everything else. But once you start turning up the volume on breathing, then you have to add even more effects because if you're <laughs> that close, that we, so you have to you have to keep in mind like how much how many sound effects do you want to put in there? For, for, for the, the one day, day he drove me a little nuts was when he, um, Radovan's you know take get in the punch get the punch. There's a punch here. There's a to the back. There's a punch here. There's a punch to this side. There's a punch to that side. And he's like, no no no, a punch to the stomach sounds different than a punch to the spleen. I was like, <laughs> you are not doing this to me. How do I know what a liver punch sounds like versus a kidney punch? Am I right? Right though. So, Punches the different parts of the body do sound different. Mm -hmm. And face yeah, shots, body different. shots, kicks, all of it sounds yeah, different. Yeah. But but this side of the of the abdomen versus that side of the abdomen, that's how careful he was getting. And that's what I was just like, you're well, not doing this to me. But the thing is, like when when I was young in a brawler mm -hmm. and I punched people in the face and like put them to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Get to, There's a sound that uh, there, it's like when you hit when you hit a 310 yard drive and you just get that right sound. <laughs> that feels right, and you know it's the same thing with a punch to the face. The punch to the face does not sound the same as a punch to the stomach. Yes. The punch to the chest. They have different tonal qualities. See, it see, was so man. obvious. TJ to just took us to a slightly dark place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, it's I'm cinematic. fascinated right now. I'm fascinated. But it's the cinematic experience, right? Yeah. You've got this. If the one thing that takes an audience member, and this is for everybody who's listening, the one thing, the biggest thing that takes an audience member out of the cinematic experience is if the sound is bad. Oh yeah. That's right. Quickly, if I hear music I've heard uh, from like a, a stock website. In a, oh, yeah. in a feature film, yeah, forget about un it. unfortunately, like I'm eating, I'm like, oh, this is bootleg. Or if I, I, I feel bad about it, but like, I have to, like, subconsciously, I can, I can tell when it's happening. Like, oh, yeah, that's not, mm -mm, that's not quality. I'm like, ooh. Oh, we had we had an, an incredible composer, Lisa Liu, because she knew from the beginning I wanted it to be classy, and I want I, I I'm crazy about movie scores, right. so I, she and I were working for twelve hours straight on Christmas Day, because I'm you know I I get that's the one thing I get into the most as an editor is massaging and changing you know layering and changing the pitch and this beat it falls on this and I add drum loops and all that sort of nice. thing. Because I, I don't know if you agree with me on this, but one of the worst things about romantic comedies, even from studio, is they add the hokey music. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, no, please. <laughs> it's a Hallmark <laughs> movie, yeah. No, I know, when you were saying it, I was like, I wonder if you're going to talk about the hokey music. You said, yes. yes. Yeah, we don't have any hokey music. No, you... You were right. Yeah. It, it all it all fits your whole your whole um, modus. It all fits together very very nice. Okay, so I, but I was curious, I want to go one one question though. So once you got the sound effect, so you watched your fight with no sound effects, right? Just probably camera noise. Once you got the sound effects in it, did your fight feel like it was like two times better than what Completely. you thought it? Because it's it's no longer this. Mm -hmm. it's which yeah. automatically makes you think oh my god they're getting hit oh my god this is an intense fight just yeah. with the sound mm -hmm. yeah i forget it every time we do a fight scene and i'm editing something and i'm like oh this is all right and then i'm like oh yeah we didn't have the sound in put the sound in my, oh yeah okay <laughs> now i'm now i'm not mad at you guys now i'm, I'm fine we got it it's good <laughs> Cause I've been home by myself. Well, I don't have the right cup with the thing. Oh, I can't believe we didn't get. And then I put the sound in, and all of a sudden it's just like, oh, this is. Oh, it's fine. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry. What were you saying, Sherry? You had a question. I want to remind everybody. Okay, so the Misadventures of Mistress Man Eater comes out tomorrow, October 30th. And I know we've been talking to you all for a while. Was there anything that you wanted to share about your film? Anything that we haven't asked, or anything you want to say about it? 
uh, rent it and tell all your friends. <laughs> if you like it, if you, if you if you like it, make sure your family, everybody you love, watch it. If you hate it, tell all your enemies. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, we will. <laughs> yes, we'll, and we'll keep sharing it and everything on our page. Uh, Chill. I know you had something to say. Yeah, it was about distribution. Oh, um, good. Yeah, so, my list. Hey, hey, you know, we we are business too. <laughs> we about beating people and getting paid for it. no. Um, <laughs> Oh, you laughed. No. Uh, <laughs> so distribution. Now, there's a couple of different places. Um, people have all sorts of things they can say about distribution these days. But as far as Amazon, since you're using Amazon, actually, is Amazon the only place that you're distributing through? At the moment. Okay. We are doing a limited VOD release right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's interesting that you asked that. We have... So our, our plan is with the marketing is that we want to use reviews to, to start getting people interested and start getting some buzz. So that's where Benjamin mm -hmm. came in. And uh, Ben was referred to me by somebody who knew somebody and that's how you all got our film so he could watch it. So we're using thank the you. reviews. Is it, Well, you're very welcome. And thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. So we're using that kind of like is the way to start. And then basically all the reviews we've gotten have all been positive. And I think Good. like seven for seven so far. Mm -hmm. So I'm using those reviews as a way to email um, distributors, film, film companies, buyers, all of those different things to okay. gauge their interest. We, we were mentored by a lot of people that we know that have done ultra low budget indies that were involved in our film in various aspects behind the scenes. And to a person, their experience with distributors for low budget indies that don't have a star attached mm -hmm. is that, oh, yay, you know, I got a distributor. If you have a decent film, it's not difficult to get a distributor. What is difficult is to ever get any money. <laughs> so the distributor will, you know, there's right. no money guaranteed mm -hmm. most of the time. And then they all always manage to find magic fees, you know, that yeah. as soon as a profit starts happening, oh, there's fine print. Oh, you never see anything. And if you got your money up front as a producer and whatever, then okay, fine. But if it's your money, you need to see mm -hmm. that coming back in so you can make the next movie. Right. Mm -hmm. so, they, so some of our friends have um, gone from, you know, oh, you know, I got my first movie, I got a distributor. They found out the, the error of that thinking. And now they're self-distributing with an aggregator yeah. um, on the various online platforms. It kind of is a, a great equalizer <laughs> that we can access the same platform as major Hollywood films. The only right. issue is how do you get people to know about it? How do you get yeah. people to pay attention instead of getting lost in it? Marketing, yay. Well, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I need to add to this because it's that's only a small portion of this. So um, have you all heard of the American film market? AFM. AFM. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yes. That's quite familiar. I, I will be at this one this year. <laughs> yeah. So. so you're going to be at it. We actually are in it. We bought a yeah. virtual screening room. Mm -hmm. And when I bought the virtual screening room, AFM, they sent me a data, an Excel spreadsheet of all of the buyers that are going to be attending. So Ooh, I got yeah. all wow. of the emails of American distributors, which I'm looking at first. Nice. So that list is like 250 film buyers. Wow. And out of those 250 film buyers, so far we've had a Lionsgate Inquirer and one a screener, which we're, we've got our fingers you crossed. It, you think so? Wow. <laughs> we have not heard back from them yet. I have to give it that caveat. Um, okay. But we've also heard back from three other film distributors and a film rep mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and awesome. today we got an offer for distribution we're not going to take it because it was ridiculous <laughs> and so i'm not going to tell you the company okay but, um they offered us money guaranteed okay three thousand dollars you can kiss you, wait a minute uh, three thousand dollars flat well, you, up front. A three thousand dollars oh. the minimum. Their cut, their cut is thirty-five percent. And we, if we want a publicist or marketing or whatever, we have to pay for it. <laughs> I've whatever. already gotten, that would that came in today. I've already gotten better offers than that, 
But as a first time filmmaker and without a name star, got it. You know, what we what we have to rely on is what the actual film is. So I wrote the person back, and that's also very important for everybody to understand. Anybody who shows interest, even if they insult you, you still have to be gracious. Yes. So I wrote, you never know. You never know. So I wrote back and I said, thank you so much for your offer, but I have to be upfront and say that we've already gotten better offers. Nice. And we have to pay more. And if you want, we would welcome another bid to come in. We're anticipating that we'll make a final decision on what we're going to do by the end of November. So if you wish to resubmit an offer, we'd be more than happy to consider it. And thank you very much. And something else to keep in in mind with distribution is we did have a small company offer, you know, through friends, make an offer. um, But they also wanted to change the cover art, which we had invested in. Um, with a great designer. Uh, that was helps. Uh, having a great trailer, having a great poster. Yeah. There's something that doesn't look like you've made it, you know, in iPhoto or whatever. Hmm. Um, so we had a, a fantastic designer, Ryan Brookhart, put together something that looks really polished, that can grab attention and ads and everything we'll use it in. Yeah. But they wanted to redo the cover art, wanted to redo the title, and they wanted it cut down by an additional 20, 25 minutes after we'd already spent so much time cutting it down 11 minutes from our initial premiere and we're like that was just their rule not because they're like oh well this doesn't help the story it was just they had this rule of comedies can't be longer than 90 minutes and so every single one of their comedies was exactly 90 minutes it's like that's not so we just felt that okay great nice people you know we had a wonderful conversation but we're not on the same page for what we want creative yeah so as as filmmakers we have to realize you know you're going to get offers but you don't have to take the first one or the second one or the third one Hmm. and you're a lot more empowered now if you educate yourself and you have someone guiding you through the fact that you can use an aggregator to get on this you can upload directly to Amazon Prime Direct. You you have more power now than you've had in the past. Yes. So did you um, did you review all the contracts and everything yourself, or did you guys have like a, an entertainment attorney, or did you just read and know enough to feel comfortable looking through all those deals? All of the above. All of the above. Okay. So yes, we um, when it came to certain certain contract things, we did have an attorney look over a few things. Um, I'm experienced with looking over contracts and Larissa, we, we're, we're both educated people. So it, reading contracts, it becomes very apparent if something seems a little sketchy. You take the emotions and the excitement and the eagerness for a distributor out of it and you can just look at it impartially. Yeah, and so I would recommend that anybody who is looking at contracts, you know, follow your gut, read it through very, very carefully, get opinions from people who are smarter than you. Who've been through this. And uh, yes. when it comes when it comes time to put pen to paper and sign it, it definitely behooves you to run it past a con- uh, an entertainment attorney or a contract attorney. Because this is your money. This it's is right. and you're going to be yeah. tied in for five, seven, 10, 15 yes. years. Well, this contract today was fi- a 15 year commitment to this company. Woo. You know, I mean, you know, I'll commit 15 years, but put some zeros behind your offer. <laughs> no kidding. G- give me something. Well, you know, you're, as far as distribution, uh, definitely seen the movie. And like I said, it reminds me of Moonlighting. So I, I, this is just, I would actually develop that into a series. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, I, that, I, that's, 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 that's my mentality. So you know, the, my you, 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 movies basis, and then you got the series. So before we go, why don't we get, why don't the three of you or the four of you give us the, those of you have seen it. How about that? Yeah. Give your audience your opinion of the movie and yeah. you know what you think of it. And uh, maybe if you could come, so you compared it to moonlighting. Yes. Anybody else have uh, any thoughts on, on, because we have a hard time finding cups. So we yeah. appreciate Ooh, that so input. Let your audience know what you think of it and uh, what the benefits are. And if they, you know, you'd think they'd enjoy it, that kind of thing. I'm trying yeah. to think of, can you thought, go first, please? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I thought that the movie was awesome. Um, it was some twists and some turns in there. Um, like I said, I enjoyed the singing that popped up, you know, I was like, oh, and they're singing too. <laughs> um, but, and then there was action. There was just so many things going on. Then of course, at the heart of it was the, you know, the love story and everything. So I really loved it. I enjoyed it. Thank you all for sharing it with us. And I would tell people that um, they should definitely go check it out tomorrow when it, um, 
when it comes on Amazon Prime. That's what I was thinking. Watch it, Keisha. Let me think. Um, I wrote an entire review of this one. You did. Yeah, I'm trying to think of specifically a comp, something I could compare it to. I can't think of anything right now that makes me that came to mind and say, "Oh, it's just like this movie." I don't, I don't know of anything that was similar to what That's I watched. That's what we like about it. It's very unique. You can't, yeah. really, but it's a challenge but too. It, but it's also a detriment because you can't say, "Oh, this is like." aliens meets predator you know i mean you know like high yeah. concept stuff this is something that's really, really uh, yeah unique it feels like it feels there's moments where it feels kind of like one of those uh not the spy dramas but those adventure movies where they're like in some foreign country and it's the 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 the, the super exciting person has to pair up with this individual who's a little bit little drab and they're on this adventure in this other country trying to find so you know trying to find this item kind of like indiana jones but it's not that's the funny part is like none of that is what's going on in this movie they they're, they're not traveling globally to do it but it has that same kind of feel in the rom-com and, and be clear i don't watch a tremendous amount of of rom-coms Really? Uh, so, you just you struck me you? as like, the person that's all you ever watch is julia yeah mm, <laughs> no Saturday. <laughs> not really uh some good music in those movies but i don't really watch those that often so when i started like okay well this will i watch an independent film i watch anything it'll be cool and i was like well it, it had action in it and the action was good which i was not really expecting action and in independent films to be all that good so i was surprised for a, a rom-com to be funny and well acted and well directed and be good and we talked about this before but i have a a specific thing for how I like to see women portrayed in film. I don't like damsels in distress. Mm -hmm. I don't watch a movie for you to to promote some hot chick with her boobs out. That's not going to get me to buy your movie or to like your movie. It's, um, it's too easy. It's cheating, yeah. right? And so the fact that this movie, like, it, it could have gone that way had you chosen to take it that way, but you didn't. Mm -hmm. It stayed smart and it stayed very, very classy. And I love the fact that the lead character was was intelligent. And yes, oh, yeah. she's, she's dressed in an interesting ensemble. <laughs> um, but I didn't feel like I was being drawn and, and pulled in by that. That was just like a part of the of the movie. It wasn't the focal point of the movie. And so all of the characters were in, interesting. Even your your friend who um, I don't want to give it away, but your your partner who plays the your your gay partner business partner, uh, mm -hmm. Gabe, uh, he he had some interesting choices towards the end of the movie that I thought was pretty funny. Um, everyone was um, entertaining. Everybody was fun to watch on screen. It looked like you guys had a really good time moving doing it. There was a there was a fire. I didn't even think twice about whether or not that fire was real. It was well done. Well I done. was like, oh, they set something on fire. I didn't even cross my mind that there wasn't that wasn't real. But my favorite probably part of the movie is <laughs> I like the cat socks. I think there were cat socks. Yeah. Yeah, the cat socks. I got them on Amazon. The, the cat socks were good. <laughs> and then the sequence inside of the church. So a lot of movies, when you uh, watch like a Ben Stiller movie, it's a lot of awkward moments. I don't particularly enjoy those super awkward moments. Mm -hmm. There is one awkward moment. It involves blue spray paint. Let's not give it away. Ooh. Ooh yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. No, but I mean, no, but it's not like no, when you're like no. in the crowd going, ooh, you like those. <laughs> Like American Pie, like it's embarrassing. Yeah, I can't do that. It's painful to watch. I don't enjoy that. And so I liked how even when there was the banter between you and uh, and the lead, it was, you might one-up him or surprise him, but he took it graciously and it was fun and it was light. And I do think that in this day and age, you can do a movie that talks about a woman being empowered being a lead protagonist that is not like the Star Wars movie you talked about. We're not going to go into detail, but there was a lot of things wrong with that. Um, that's lighthearted, but still hits those topics in a respectful way, in a way that everyone can accept and that it's good. And you're not forcing it 
like it was all natural and I believed it when I watched it. And so I really, really enjoyed watching your movie. And I'm, I'm very, very glad you guys came on the show today. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ben. You were going to say something, Keisha. Oh, I was going to, I was just going to ask if you could quickly, cause you described it to us, tell people before chill, if you don't mind, go, um, how you did that fire. Oh, you yeah. talked to us yeah. about that yesterday, but I thought it was really cool what you shared. Yeah, yeah, we'll tell. We'll, I'd love to talk to you about that. So, yeah. um, so the night of the fire scene was really, really interesting because we had we long had it scheduled because we needed the fire department, we needed a paramedic, we needed the ambulance. It was the last the night we rented the church for. Yeah, it was the last night that we rented the church. And then our actors, as SAG actors, you know, in advance they have their contract. You are contracted for these days. So, so <laughs> you might not get be able to get them other days. So anyway, that day we realized that there was a giant cold front coming in from the west. You should have seen me every night. We had to shoot an outdoor scene. I'm 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 on the on my phone the night before. Look What's the weather? The What's the weather? What's the weather? Well, you know that goes. This night was it was it was coming, and we knew it was coming. So we rescheduled everybody. We had everybody come in. We rehearsed that scene over and over again. And it wasn't just the actors. You had to choreograph the camera movement as well, right. which is very similar to like fight scenes. You have to choreograph not just the fighters, but the camera movement. Yeah. We and, shot with two cameras because we knew time would be precious. Yes. And uh, so we needed to shoot in the dark. It was scheduled to start raining in the forecast at 7 p.m., and we couldn't start shooting until dark at about 8.45. Well, it's the oh. middle of June, so it didn't get dark, dark until, until after 9.30. So what happened that night was actually inexplicable. <laughs> this, this front was coming in from the northwest just in a straight line. Mm -hmm. And as it started getting closer to us, you could see that it kind of like became concave. And this front went all around us <laughs> and left us dry. I, I credit my dear departed director, editor, mentor, friend, uh, was, Chris Scruns for that. I'm like, thank you, Chris. Yeah, it was <laughs> unbelievable wow. how this was like the movie gods were smiling on us. I think Keisha awesome. wanted to know about the lighting though. So, but I'll, I'm getting there. I'll get there. I'll get there. So, so anyway, Process. we had like nine and a half hours of shooting scheduled to shoot that scene. We got it done in under an hour and a half. Wow. Because it, because it was, we, there was, we were desperate. Two takes each done. Two takes each. Oh, yeah. Okay. And so as far as the fire scene went, we had mini spots in all the lights and what, what our gaffer did is he had multiple color gels. So we had amber gels, yellow mm -hmm. gels, red gels. And all the windows. In, in all the windows. Yes, and all the windows. So many spots in all the windows. And he put these gels in front of the lights. And then he took scissors and shredded them at the bottom. And then put a fan oh, on the gels. Okay. And then the gels would be doing this. So you would get the white light, the yellow light the red light the amber light the orange light whatever it was fluttering nice. with all of these fans blowing on it which on the, gave the, window. the effect right. of fire and then we didn't have enough fans to do it so we had the fans on the ones that we really really needed but oh. for everything else we had larissa's mom who was doing craft service we had the uh, customer, yeah. we had other Makeup. people, and they're holding these boards, <laughs> yeah. flapping, yeah. you know, I would yep. call action, yeah. and they'd start flapping like yeah. crazy, and I had the smoke machines going. That's when you need two team players who aren't divas. Team players. Yeah. <laughs> and what was interesting so is that for, man. <laughs> we had people driving down the street, stopping, yeah. wondering <laughs> if the church was on fire, <laughs> because it looks so That's real. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. But it was all practical effects. We didn't have to use any CGI for any of that. Really? And we couldn't have anyway because our cameras were in movement. So they weren't locked down and there was no way you could Got see it. anything if the camera wasn't locked down. Yeah. That was, no, that's impressive. And if anybody who's ever been on an independent film set, especially as a PA, you have fanned some smoke. <laughs> oh, <laughs> heck yeah. Hey, it's a rite of passage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So awesome, awesome. So chill, I think, do, do, do we get your uh, view Thank on you for there? sharing that. Thank no, you. The, well, yeah, well.
one that was my question as far as far as how did you uh achieve those effects okay uh very well done uh the the, the uh, miss smoke whatever you're using i was inside the church was impressive um but i only got one thing i disagree with you on what was that you can move the camera you don't need to be locked oh down. It, it's just the effects guy it's well, just it's just easier. <laughs> it's just much, 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 much easier. And see, that's why I need to learn more after effects for the next shoot so that I can know that and not just take everybody's word. Well, let me well, tell you well, well but here, here's the thing about that goes. Now that goes. If you're just learning, keep the camera locked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Please keep that camera locked. But <laughs> I, 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 but a, afterwards, because you got to do with stuff in Nuke or whatever. But uh, yeah, After Effects will help you out. We'll, we can talk to me, me about the old Bernie stuff. But well, in essence, all the stuff as far as uh, how you shot it, the effects, the cutting, the acting, it wasn't overacted. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't underacted yeah. either. Um, it, it to me, the movie what it was what it needed to be. You know, it, it it didn't say that, you know, you're watching Gone with the Wind. I mean, you're, you're not, you know, after that, it's you're, you're telling me this, it's that, you know, you're on point. Love it. Keep on going. Yeah. And I want to be real. Austin Action Fest, if if I hated the movie, they would not be on the show. I, I would have like said, hey, guys, great job completing your films. A lot of hard work. Really Good proud luck. of you guys. Far away from here. <laughs> but I wouldn't I wouldn't bring them on the show. So yes. I'm very, very happy to have you guys. Thank you so much for being well, as transparent. Do I not get to say anything? No. No, no Danielle. Yeah, sorry. I'm not kicking them off. I'm just yeah. saying thank you. Like at the oh beginning, God. I wasn't introduced. At the end, I don't oh my gosh, you're never gonna live this down. Oh my <laughs> gosh, mom, dollar and <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> this, this is Weatherford. Would you please give us your opinions and your insights that we need to hear on this movie? Because if you would, please, because of my wisdom, your your movie was fantastic. <laughs> now, let me change that the way I talk. Thank you. I I enjoyed it, and you know what I was thinking was I was thinking like across. There's some there's some um, British comedies. And there's one that's about a chaplain, and it has a little bit of that. And I'm forgetting the name of it right now. But I'm like I was thinking like uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith crossed with Moonlighting. Um, mm. um, just th there was a few things in there, but. And even um, just feelings that I would feel when I'd watch musicals when I was younger and the romance comedies and things in there. But and the reason I bring that up is brought me into the story where I wanted to be you. <laughs> you know? If I if I wanna if I wanna be that person and 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 there's there's the in, anyway, there's the sexiness, there's the empowerment anyway there's all these different levels that I, I was brought into that I didn't quite know where to piece all that together but I wanted to be there and so if you can do that to me um, then that says something because that means I stay in the movie and I don't I don't get taken out and I'm in my own space and so musicians if they do that to me then that's you know watching Jane Leno or somebody um, Johnny Carson when I was younger if I could just disappear from yeah. listening to that voice, then it's something for me. So I enjoyed that, um, that that taking me out of the world I was in. Yeah. Um, so Thank you for too. saying Thank that. You. I think that's such an important part of storytelling and being a good film. It's and that's, world building. And well, that's what I loved as our one screening that we got in an actual theater before <laughs> COVID happened. Yes. Yeah, so. Wasn't the it wasn't the red carpet and all the people because I actually find that very overwhelming. I have a shy side to me, believe it or not. <laughs> but what I loved was in the dark, hearing the laughter, knowing that people were with me lockstep or with Ava, the character, feeling what she felt, like you, like you said, disappearing inside and experiencing this journey and this world that once was just neurons firing in my brain. To be able to create that, an adventure for people to go on that's no longer in here, but there, right. that is a great privilege that we have as storytellers and hopefully we can all do more of that. Awesome. Hey, uh, make Thank it you. a series. 
make it a yeah. series, develop it I... into a series. I want, I want to see. You may want to, you know, name it different for a series. You know, uh, HB, maybe HBO. I it. love the name. Yeah, you know, I liked it. It was tough. It was so tough. I liked it. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm chill, thinking like chill. NBC. NBC. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I got you. Yeah. Yeah, yo. Otherwise, keep it. Shoot. Thank you again for your time oh, and again yeah. for sharing your movie with us. We very much appreciate it. Yeah. And if and, go ahead. No, no, go. You go ahead. We had such a blast with all of you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. To be able to speak filmmaker to filmmaker, people who know what it's like on the inside and who want to share those secrets. It was a true joy and delight. You t you said stuff to us that I'm sure a lot of people haven't heard. So we got to thank you. And keep us, please, keep us posted on the entire process. Uh, please. Whatever new developments, let us know. We'll continue. We'll go on Facebook, Ben. We're yeah. Friends, so. Yeah, I'll see it now. <laughs> yeah, we have just started the journey of marketing and distribution and seeing what that's going to look like, if we're going to work with a film by, or a film um, rep or not, you know, what kind of distributors we're going to do for worldwide. So we're still at the beginning of this and we'll check back with you in a couple months and hopefully let you and your listening audience know how it turns out for us. Awesome. Honor, honor to awesome. Have you. awesome. So it's been our pleasure. We're here, CJ and Larissa. Uh, binary star pictures. I said that correct. Yep. Yes. Fantastic. The, two, the stars that revolve around each other. Oh, wow. Yeah, this like is that. good. So guys, one, you can be in a family and be in business together. Just want to put that out yes. there. It happen right now. Uh, thank you guys so much for, for being with us today. Everyone who watched this, everyone who will watch this. CJ and Larissa for coming on. Keisha, Dan, Danielle, <laughs> Miss Danielle Weatherford. Weatherford in the house. Weatherford. <laughs> Chill. I'm Benjamin Reddick, a.k.a. The Violence Conductor. Thank you for being with us. We will catch you guys on the next one. And let, me, bye, let, me do the, let me do the outro here because, you know, we're not playing videos. <clears throat> I thought you were going to do it. Yeah, I am. He's working up to it. <laughs> Thank you for coming to the... Okay. Thank you for listening to the Austin Action Fest podcast, where we talk about you getting your film in the can, sending it out to the world to see. Thank you for listening to the Austin Action Fest podcast. Thank you for welcome... <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Austin Action Fest podcast. My ribs hurt. I'm just cracking up. <laughs> oh my god! And we're out. <laughs> All right, we're uh, yeah, exactly. Thank you for listening to the Austin Action Fest podcast.